First term, second term, I was a list man. Okay, so <laughs> after I'd won, so you you made you made the leap across the driveway. Um, how how has the role of uh, the White House political advisor changed? Uh, there's, there's there's always been somebody in a White House who's who's uh, who basically does politics. Uh, uh, it was Chuck Colson for Nixon. Uh, they they may not have had the title political director. Lynn Nostiger, who was my my mentor and great friend. Uh, was the first one to actually have the title <coughs> White House political director. Uh, he left after a year, uh, and basically I, I had it for the next three or four years. What we tried to do is because we, and, and I think it was the correct role, because Ronald Reagan did not want, if you mentioned to Ronald Reagan, politically, Mr. President, you need to do this, he would basically balk on you. He said, we didn't come here to do politics. So you had to basically go all the way around and try and figure out another way, another way of saying it. But what we did is we created a political network of people who had been in our campaigns and what have you in the agencies, and they sort of watched things that were occurring. Uh, the, the, you didn't make political decisions, but you basically realized the political impact of what was going on. And what I always try to do is, is make sure that the president and the cabinet knew, okay, you want to make this decision, this is a good government decision. Uh, you're going to close steel mills in Pittsburgh, you're going to cost Dick Thornburg the governorship. Just understand that. Uh, you know, you still may want to go ahead and make that decision, but there's a political impact to it. And I think that's an important role. I think that's a role that needs to basically be made at all times. Uh, I also think it's not unfair to basically take care of the constituencies that help get you there. Uh, and that's, in essence, what we did. We, you know, we have a public liaison shop or what have you. Uh, that's what Colson used to have. But, you know, you've got you've to always be looking out for those. I mean, you, you're the president of all the people, and that's very important. But at the same time, you can't forget those that got you there. Because if you're not going to be in a position where you can get yourself reelected or get yourself to build that power base, uh, you, you get lame duck very quickly. And I, and I think to a certain extent, this White House was far more political, uh, and I think each one has expanded. I think Carl clearly, you know, we, we shut the political shop down. We all went out and ran the reelection campaign. You know, I went back in afterwards. Uh, uh, I, I think they, some, some places have never shut it down. Lyndon Johnson ran it from the White House. Uh, Jimmy Carter ran a lot of it from the White House. Uh, you know, I think to a certain extent, you have to sometimes think in terms of the line, and the line's very important. Uh, you know, I, I don't think this administration has served itself, once again, I don't mean to be critical of it always, uh, because it looks too political. Gibbs every day looked co political. Gibbs did not look like he was anything but a, but a campaign press secretary. And I think that antagonized the media, and I think it antagonized the public. Ro Roger, you're, you're sort of a, the, the pure consultant who never went into government. Is that right? That's right. Uh, what, what, but from your perspective, the role of a consultant, how has that changed over the last 30 years? Well, in my, in my particular field, because I started off in direct mail, and direct, when, when we use the term direct mail is vigory, and I uh, did it on the right and the left, it was really the... We were the consultants, the creative, the media people. Mail was the was a channel. Now, when you think of direct mail, you think of um, a highly technical uh, printing paper, ink, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but the but the role of the uh, at least the the role, I think Richard would say he played too, and I played was to was to work with people who had a vision, take that vision and translate it to a targeted group of people and then build an engine for support that was sustainable over a long period of time, both financially and, uh, and emotionally. And, and uh, that, that time difference is, has now become significant because it's, these things are no longer as, as easily possible as they, uh, as they were. So that, but, but if I were to come back without paper and ink, it would be to, to, to find causes that matter to, uh, to people and uh, provide the help they need to sustain. I mean, building the women's movement, of which I'm the proudest, uh, together with, with thousands and thousands of people, was a very difficult thing, but it was essential that it be done. And David, damn it, I can't figure out there are more uterus owners than gun owners, <laughs> and why we can't uh, uh, <laughs> defeat you, I don't know. <laughs> Uh, women like guns, too. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say a lot of them are armed. <laughs> yeah, ask Sarah Palin. So, um, Mark, we've talked about the, the changing technology. The other thing that's changed is the proliferation of polling. There is an unbelievable amount of polling today in a way that there never was before. Uh, I think Ed may have said, you know, in a campaign, 
you would have a couple benchmark polls and two or three, and that would be it. And now, of course, not just in governing, but in campaigning, it's all the time. But in your experience, how has the role of a consultant changed over the last uh, 25, 30 years? Well, there's no question that there is more polling. The, the late David Broder, uh, I remember, did an article about uh, John Danforth, Senator John Danforth's campaign, doing nightly tracking. And the, they, uh, David, or at least the people he was quoting, ascribed Danforth's victory to this uh, daily tracking. And uh, uh, the next year, everybody did daily tracking uh, because that's the way you win. Uh, and so the reality is we do more and more of it, and we do more and more different kinds of testing. So as, whereas before, you know, if you look at the early days of polling, uh, people like Lou Harris and others who were involved in, in campaigns, uh, basically, are we ahead and are, or are we behind, and who are we ahead with and who are we behind with? And that was basically uh, what was looked at. Uh, Pat Cadell, I think, really helped to create a revolution in polling, looking at message testing in polling. And of course, that's become increasingly uh, more sophisticated over time. And we still do the same basic targeting activity, but the reality is now, uh, polling is really implicated in every major strategic decision that a campaign makes. What to say, who to say it to, when to say it, uh, how to say it. Ad testing has become an important part of, of, of our portfolio and I think of most uh, pollsters. Uh, you know, we used to, the creative people used to run wild. Now we sort of chain them down to research and testing and say, you know, look, we have three ads here. We have three executions. Which one works better? Which one works less well? And everything is, is sort of data driven. So. Uh, I think increasingly campaigns have become data driven and the pollsters tend to be the repository of the data and that's, I think, created a more central role, frankly, for pollsters today than in the past. Dave. It's very important. When I started in the business, there was a general consultant and we in turn hired the media consultant, we hired the mail guy, we hired the pollster. We sort of made the determined, hired a campaign manager, oftentimes we were the campaign manager. But we made those decisions. Today, pollsters have become the strategist and most campaigns today are driven by the pollster. Pollster's hired, he basically, you know, the roles you've played and others have played, I'm not arguing that it's good, bad, or indifferent, I'm just simply saying that is the role that plays. The general consultant is, is, is pretty much non-existent anymore, and people say, why should I spend all that money for a guy that's basically not, doesn't have any real task? And I say it's like building a house without a general contractor, you know? You want the electricians, the guys, the carpenters, everybody else to come, come do whatever parts they want to do. So I always argue whoever plays that role always has that obligation to, to create that discipline. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, I'm going to finish with Dave. Dave. Dave, I know the longest on this panel. Uh, Dave and I met in the late 1970s uh, when he was involved in a crusade to prevent Ronald Reagan from becoming president. Because uh, he was a liberal? <laughs> as, as the political director of, of, uh, of uh, the first George Bush for president campaign. Um, putting it a little pejoratively. Uh, <laughs> if, if you'd been around earlier, you were Yeah, you were in 76, <laughs> you were for Reagan, and in 88, you were for Dole. So you were always on the right side of things. But um, uh, I, I think of you as both an insider and an outsider, and as, as both a participant and an observer of this. I'm, I'm interested in your perspective from both inside and outside of how you see the role of consultants in, in political consultants changing over that long 40-year sweep. Well, Ed touched on, on what I think is very important. I used to say that w when I was doing consulting, I did general consulting, that once you've picked your campaign team, you know what the campaign is going to be about yeah. because, uh, because the good consultants try to do things, uh, uh, try to look at the world anew every morning, but most consultants, including good ones, try to repeat their successes or, or, or try to do what they've done before that's worked. Uh, and so if you, you know, you, if you were running this kind of a campaign, you hired this kind of consultant and this kind of pollster and, and you knew what it was going to be. Uh, if you hire a good example was um, after this, uh, after the 76 race, um, uh, I was consulting for Stu Spencer uh, in the Ford campaign. And uh, if you remember, toward the end, there was a question of where would they put their resources? Would they throw their resources into the South, which was, qu which was tightening up very, very quickly, or would they put them into New Jersey and Ohio? And Stu called and wanted to know if I'd come to this meeting to discuss this, and I said, who's going to be at the meeting? It was going to be Doug Bailey and Deardorff, and, and, uh, and I said, well, the resources are going into the <laughs> into Ohio and New Jersey. There's no reason to come to the meeting. I mean, with most meetings, if if you if you know who's going to be there, you know what the outcome's going to be, and why should you go and, <laughs> and be one guy at the table uh, trying to ruin the garden party? 
But that's the way campaigns, and so if you're, in, and now as, as Ed says, consultants do fill that. Now, the other important thing that uh, also mentioned by Ed and others is the, is the, when you're in power, the division. Uh, a, a president or a senator or a governor has to be politically cognizant if he wants to achieve his or her policy goals because you can't succeed on the one hand without worrying about the other thing. So that, but, but we have, we have developed more and more people who, who allow the policy goals to take the back seat to their political goals and operations because the most important, most important thing to them is the politics and not the policy, no matter what they say or no matter how, why they got into it. I, I, I was once uh, on the, on the uh, board of visitors at the Duke Public Policy School, which is like the Kennedy thing, and then I, and I, I finally resigned because, because I said they only, all, all these schools do is teach people how to be in politics for the sake of being in politics. Uh, and they don't consider anything else. And that's really not what the country needs. But we have developed in both parties a generation of people who are like that. Uh, and, uh, and, and consequently, it's one of the reasons for the frustration in the country because whoever the people are, whoever the players are, they tend to come out of the same place. Uh, you know, when, uh, when, we, uh, when the Republicans won the House in 1994, complaining about many of the things that Republicans complained about this time, uh, within a few months, uh, the Speaker of the House got his uh, freshmen together and said, you know, the single most important thing for this country is that we get reelected. Uh, and then he said, and here are the appropriators, so tell me what you need and we'll get them. And I told him that was the end of your revolution. But both parties tend to have too many people who forget where they came, came from and are mostly focused on where they want to be and in the process forget why it is they got to where they are. And I think that's a big, that's a big change. Now, there, there have always been those kind of people in politics, but I think there are more of them today. On that note, Thank you all very much. Thanks a lot. Always good to see you.